All right. Where we left off last time was taking our code and refactoring it and making it more reusable. And we took a little example of um, like a tip calculator that calculated, given a certain cost for a meal, whether the person uh, ate it um, or, or took it to go, and then based on a certain rating, uh, there might be potentially a tip left. And we created, um, uh, we created um, in our first pass, code that did it, but code that was attached to the button. And that's bad because then that code can only be used on that button. All right. Even elsewhere on the same page, you couldn't reuse that code. So that's about as bad as you could do as far as reusability goes. Um, so we went to the next stage where we took and we broke out uh, that code. And we actually ended up breaking it out into several functions, which was, which was good. And the idea from that is that would give us greater flexibility because we could call one function without calling the other, depending on, on what we really wanted to do. And we um, changed it to, to use those functions, and it did the same thing as before, but it was a lot more reusable insofar as anywhere on that page we could call and, and use that code. However, still not as reusable as it could be because on another page we would still have to start out from scratch again, and, and, and there's nothing we could, we could do about it right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to take a second to look at a code. I had a question that I want to uh, uh, try to answer. And uh, then we'll move on to sort of the next, uh, next uh, step up to make it where it would be reusable wherever we wanted to within the application. So let's go and look at this. All right. Notice there's almost no code in the event itself. The code uh, in the event really, all it does is it, it gets the inputs, it calls a function, and it does something with the response. So um, really who, the, the, the calling function, whoever's going to call our business logic function, is responsible for pulling all the data together, calling the function, and then dealing with the result. We try to make the functions what we call black boxes. That is, it took some inputs, did its thing, and produced an output. The function shouldn't care where that input comes from. It should be passed to it as an argument. So in this example, we have a text box and radio buttons and, and drop downs. But we could potentially have another, um, uh, another interface that was different, that had different controls on it. And then it would be that function's on click event, it would be responsible for gathering the input, formatting it, sending it to this function, and then doing something with the results. All right, so we talked about this you know, as, as being our business logic function, being these down here that actually do something related to our business or organization or application. And this being the code that sort of glues our user interface to um, to uh, our, our business logic. We talked about coupling and we said it's good if it's loosely coupled. In other words, the interface and the business logic code aren't intertwined. That's how our first pass was. Our first pass, the code that did the business logic actually looked and pulled stuff out of the text box. Here, our little boss function or our little control function does all that, formats it, sends it, and then does something with the results. Now, I had a question before. Um, how can we make it so that if we press enter, this button gets clicked? That's a great feature to have, a great usability feature to have. Um, I, I was telling folks that were uh, here uh, before that that's one thing that absolutely drives me crazy about our own website. If I was going to search for myself, let's say, and I typed in Zellers and hit return, doesn't do anything. It re simply reloads the form, doesn't submit it. I have to actually go and click the button to do a search. All right. So, how can we do that? 
I had no idea how to do that. So I, I Googled it and what you can do is you can set, apparently, you, there's a default button property in the form or in the panel depending, um, you know, depending on whether you're using panels or not. And we can set that default button as an attribute on the form. So let's go here and let's look at the form. Again, I'm going to go and pick, I want the form. And if I look here, default button, there's the attribute, and I have to give it the name of that, which is button one. So if I go in here and give the default button attribute of the form a value, then it should be set so that I should be able to just press the button, press the enter button, and it accepts it. Let's test it to make sure. All right, so we go in and let's say, uh, not touching the mouse, I hit enter and it invoked the button. So, good question. Um, you know, there's a, what, there, there's some ad for spaghetti sauce. I forget the brand, but um, the, 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 the person, you know, the, the person that makes their home cooked sauce says, well, what about the oregano? And the person says, it's in there. What about the garlic? It's in there. What about the tomatoes? It's in there. Um, you can almost make that sort of assumption in the .NET framework. And I use the word almost. All right? It's not such that anything you want to do, there's something in the framework to handle it. But for a lot of the very common things that you'd want to do, there is something in the framework to handle it. So by all means, you know, um, it's just a matter of finding it. And again, I guess I would have thought that maybe this would have been an attribute of the button that said when you press enter, <laughs> click this. But if I think about it, well, there could potentially be two buttons on a form. What happens if you set that property for both? So again, the property exists actually on the form level, not on the button level. So it's just a matter, remember, this is an object-oriented world. And in an object-oriented world, your job is to find the properties and methods that do what you want to do, that accomplish what you want to do. All right. Now, all these things that we've been putting on our page in the .NET framework, I've been calling them sort of informally components or controls. They're really classes. And a class is, is like a template for members of its class. Uh, in other words, all buttons have certain behaviors. All buttons have certain attributes. So there's a button class that describes what does a button have? What can a button do? All right. Likewise with text boxes, you know, we talked about there's the text property of it, there's a visibility property. All these controls are really classes that we make objects of, that is we make instances of those object or of those classes, and then we can use and access the properties and methods of it. Now by with Visual Studio, you know, you kind of make it very easily by just dragging and dropping on there. Uh, but really, um, what you're doing essentially when you drag a text box on there is you're making a text box object, an object of the class text box on your page and you're giving it a certain name and then you can program it. Now, Visual Studio includes a lot of code um, for very general tasks that any web developer would want to use, right? The stuff that we looked at so far are, are, are things that, that any web developer would want to do, you know. Almost anyone might want to use a calendar on their site. Almost anyone is going to want to validate their forms. Almost anyone might want to enter a password, so to have a password control, all right? Um, however, Visual Studio, um, 
the kinds of components that they create are, again, the very general ones, ones that, again, any web developer might want to be able to use. You may have certain things within your application that it would be great if you had a component to plug in different places, much like we can plug in our validation control, set some properties for it, and we can do validation on any page without having to custom code it. Same idea here with business rules and business logic. So let's say in this example that my tip calculation, again, kind of a silly example, but let's say that that was some function that was critical to our, our business. I don't know, our executives went out to lunch a lot or something, I don't know. So it was something that we wanted to be able to duplicate in several different places. You know, maybe a certain payroll calculation, maybe a shipping calculation, um, or something along those lines you, you might think of. So let's say that it was something that we wanted to repeat from page to page to page. The solution that we have so far isn't adequate. All right, because the solution that we have so far for that, that code lives on this page. So we can't easily plug that code into other pages. All right, so what can we do? We can create a class that's like an ASP.NET component, but it's a class that we create. And it's a class that we create for our business logic needs and for our specific needs. You know, so the .NET framework can't address every business problem in, in the universe, right? So it, it addresses the very general ones of web development. And then you can develop some of your own components, that is classes, uh, to address some of your needs. So what we're going to do, our next step is going to be to take this code out of the page altogether and put it in a custom class. And that custom class we can then bring in and use on any number of different pages. So that will be our goal. And at that point, we'll, I might have a few more comments, but we'll, we'll stop. We'll, we've gotten pretty, pretty darn reusable at that point. So the, for the purposes of this class, we will have done what we need to do. All right. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to File, New, File. And I'm going to select that I want to create a class. And by default, it will call it class.vb. I should give it um, some sort of uh, more descriptive term. Let's say I'm going to have everything in this class about going out for dinner, all right, including the, the class, you know, uh, the, the tip calculation, the tax calculation and so on. So I'm going to call this dinner.vb. Alright, and I'll click add. It's going to give me a warning, not really a warning, but it's telling me I probably want to put it in a certain folder. Alright, so well, I'll take its advice and I will click yes and create that folder. What it will do now is it actually will put my custom classes in an app code folder. Alright, <coughs> Just sort of an additional way to have our stuff organized. All right? So that we, we don't mix our, our, our business logic classes are, are separate from our web pages and code behind files. Now, it creates a class for us. All right? We can then go in and we can define any attributes, all right, and or methods that we want this class to have. Now, what I'm going to do in this example is I'm simply going to copy all the functions from my code, uh, my code behind to this. And at least the first time that I do it, we're not going to use any attributes. I'm just going to use all functions and we'll pass arguments to those functions. Then afterwards, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about attributes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here into my code behind and I'm going to cut these functions out. And I'm going to paste them into my function. Now, I'm going to change this.
from protected to public. All right. Protected means that this function can only be called within this class or within ancestors of this class. Now, in this particular course, because um, it's conceivable, the only prerequisite for this course is the 216 course, it's conceivable you've not had VB, so we're not going to talk about like inherent, inheritance and object-oriented stuff in, in any great detail, uh, but you can actually inherit a class, a class can inherit another class, uh, or inherit from another class, and what that does is that extends it to make a more specialized version of the class, you know, a... Uh, a flying vehicle could be one class, and then an ancestor for that could be a helicopter. A different ancestor for it could be an airplane, and then, uh, a zeppelin could be a third uh, ancestor. They all have things in common because all flying things have certain things in common, but there's something distinct about zeppelins and helicopters and airplanes. All right? But I, don't, I want this code to be able to be called from other places other than within this object and its ancestors. So I'm going to change this code. Wherever I want it to be called anywhere by the outside world, I'm going to change the function to be a public function. Usually many of your functions are going to be public because that's what you're doing is you're giving the opportunity. You've put this code in one place. You're giving the outside world a chance to call that code. So I'm going to make all of these public. When would you not make a function public? Well, if it was something like an intermediary step in the calculation that you don't think anyone from the outside world would need just that step by itself, then I might make it protected. All right? But in this case, in this example, all I want is the total cost of the, uh, uh, of the dinner. But in other examples, I might want the tax, only the tax or only the tip or something like that. So I want to make all the functions public so whoever calls it can decide which functions they want to call and not restrict them. All right, so I've made my three functions all public. Now what I have to do is I have the little blue squiggly line underneath that that's telling me that this code doesn't know where the calculate total function is. All right? It doesn't know it because it used to be as part of this page and then I cut it and pasted it somewhere else. It has no idea that it's in my custom class, even if I save it. Right? Because there could be a bunch of calculate total functions. There could be a calculate total function in the dinner uh, object there could be a, uh, or class. There could be a calculate total function in the shipping class to calculate the total shipping charge. There could be a calculate total in the order class to calculate the order total. So it doesn't know where to find that shipping, uh, I'm sorry, that calculate total uh, function. So we got to tell it. All right. Here's how we're going to tell it. Now that I've defined these classes, or this class rather, I can make an object of that class. And I do that this way. I say dim D as new dinner. All right. You'll notice a couple of things uh, about that. It looks like my other dim statement, right, where I dim a variable as and then I give it a type. The type is the name of the class that I created. So the class that I created was called dinner. So I can say and dim a variable as new dinner. So what that does is that creates an object of that class, an instance of that class. It creates a dinner object and that means we can access any of the properties or methods that exist or that are available on that dinner class. Just like we create a text box object on our page. We can ac uh, access all of the things that are associated with a text box class or a drop down or a button or any of the other 
build in ASP.NET classes or components. We can access, when we make one of them, we can access everything that we can about that particular class. Well here we're not making one that's built into the framework, we're, we're making an instance of the class that we created. So we can access any of the functions on that particular class. Now, you'll notice that there's a little difference between these two dim statements. All right? dim, this one simply says dim result as double. This one says dim d as new dinner. You don't need the new with double. You need the new with dinner though. Why is that? The reason for that is simple variables like doubles or integers or booleans are what are called uh, oftentimes in programming primitives. All right. What do I mean by a primitive? A primitive is a, just a very simple variable. There's, there's really, you know, what, what is there about a double? It's value. Right? What is there about an integer? It's value. What is, it about the, uh, what is there about a date? Well, there's, there's a date. You know, it's just very simple. As, compo as compared to an object that can have a bunch of properties. What, what attributes are there for a text box? There's a bunch of them. There's a CSS class for the text box. There's the text of the text uh, uh, box. There's the width of the text box. There's a whole bunch of attributes associated with the text box. So that's an object. Now, because of the difference between a primitive being a simpler thing and an object being more involved, we have to actually do two steps. We declare our variable and then, if needed, we create that object. And we can create that where we need to. Now, you um, have to create it before you can use it. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't know, you know, what particular instance of the object we're, we're using. Now that I've done that, I can say, what calculate dinner function do I want? Well, I want the one associated with my dinner class. So I can call d dot calculate total. And what will that do? Well, since d is of type dinner, it will call the calculate total function that lives on this page. So, now that code lives in another file, lives in another component, yet this component can still use it and access it. And if I made a different page, all right, if I made a different page, I could go in and um, hook into this uh, uh, hook into that component and call it. So since it's external, I can then use and do a similar thing on as many different pages as I have. And it doesn't matter. They, the pages can look differently. It doesn't have to have the same text boxes and radio buttons and all that because wherever that data comes from will fill into the function and will run it. Let's run this and make sure that it does in fact still work. All right, we'll say $50 and we'll say it is dine in and excellent service. And it comes up with, and I believe that's the right answer. All right, at the very least, it's the answer we've been getting. So if we're wrong, we're, we're wrong the same way we were before. So now, any page can use that. Any page can use that. So if something about the rules change, let's say the governor enacts a, a law that says that everything gets taxed, whether it's dine-in or carry-out, for example. I don't have to go and track down every page that does this calculation. I would just have to go into this custom class and change the function, change the rule for how the tax is created. Or let's say the rate changes, or whatever. Let's say I decide, gee, 20% is too much for a good tip, or maybe not enough. I want to change that to 18% or 22%. I can make that change in one place, and any application that uses it, or I'm sorry, any page that uses it, will refer to, to the new code. 
right? It's very comparable to like putting CSS in a separate file or putting JavaScript in an, uh, an external file, all right? You put it there, then a lot of different places can use it and can share it and so on. Questions? Now, what I'm going to do now, and, and I could do this for all of the three fields, the dine-in, the carry-out, and all that, but I actually could make an attribute associated with this dinner. And I could not pass that as an argument. I could instead make that an attribute of this class. And I could set the attribute of the class once, and then I wouldn't have to, every time I call the method, pass the food cost. Um, Keep in mind that um, there's a lot of ways I could do it. There's nothing per se wrong with how I did it uh, in the original example, but I'm just showing a, another way of doing it. True classes typically have both attributes and methods. They have characteristics and they have things that they can do. So maybe the characteristic of this dinner is what the uh, total of the food cost is. Then I have methods for calculating the uh, tip calculating the tax. I suppose I could make those attributes too, but I'm not going to, all right? Uh, because it sort of makes sense to me. What's the real characteristic of the meal? That's the cost. The other things can be calculated based on that. So it kind of makes sense to do it that way. Now, what I can do is I can do this. Instead of passing that as an argument here, I can set it as an attribute. I didn't want to do that. I'm simply going to change these functions not to use that as an argument, but instead to use the attribute. Okay, so knock on wood, I hope I got everything. Let's run it and then we can talk about it again. Let's make sure it's right first though. All right, we go in and $50, dine in, excellent service, and it does the calculation. Is everyone clear on the idea of the difference between an attribute and a method? An attribute is something that's a characteristic of that entity. So if I was calculating, um, if I wanted to process this dinner, you know, I, I was an executive and I went to our little tip calculating website, all right, um, I'm, that object that I'm creating is sort of a software model of my dinner that I just had with all the relevant things. Now, what's relevant for this isn't what I had to eat or anything like that, but the cost of the meal. So that's a characteristic of the meal. So that's an attribute. The other fields, the tip and the sales tax, 
are calculated based on that attribute. All right? So I can define an attribute in that class, and I can set the attribute in the class. This line here is almost exactly like label.1text equals. In this case, this is the object. It's a label object, right? And I'm setting the text property of it. In this case, I have a object called D, which is a dinner object, and I'm setting the property called food cost. All right? And I set it to that, and then I can go do the calculation, and inside my class, I can go and use that value for food cost in any of my methods after I've set it. So that saves me from having to pass the cost of the food every time. All right? Because it kind of makes sense, you know, that's a characteristic of it, that, you know, that is what it is. Then I can call these other things to do the calculation. Questions about that? Now, one last thing uh, about this is that it's generally a good strategy to make your attributes private. All right? Because I can put validation code in here to validate that I give a proper value, right? For example, a meal costs a positive amount of money, right? I can't put in that says, you know, I can't put in a meal that says that this meal costs negative $10, right? This class should know about that, and this class should enforce that rule. That's what's called encapsulation by the way, where everything about a particular entity or a business entity or whatever you want to call it is included within the class. What I'm going to do now is what's called data hiding. All right? I don't want the outside world to go in and be able to manipulate these attributes directly. I want to put some control over that. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a function called set cost and I will dim my um, argument as double Actually, I should make this a subroutine because it's not going to return anything. And then I can say food cost equals arg cost. Then, if you notice now, I'm going to make my attribute private, which means that the outside world can't access it. So if I go to compile this, I'm going to get an error. And the error says, I, am not access I cannot access the attribute dinner food cost because I've made it private. That means the outside world can't get to it. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my set cost function. Now, to be sure, this is a fine point, all right? The reason you do this, though, is the same reason that when you buy a monitor, all right, let's say, let's say this monitor blew up and I had to go get a new one, all right? I don't have to go and crack open the case of the computer and wire the monitor and solder it right on the motherboard, <laughs> right? That wouldn't be very good. I shouldn't have to go into the inside of the computer to do something. What do we have instead? We have these nice little connectors or interfaces where I can take one component and plug it into the other. That saves me the problem of maybe plugging it in somewhere where it doesn't belong, doing something wrong and blowing everything up. Think of this set function the same way, all right? Think of it as being, hey, 
Um, I don't want them to be able to access this attribute directly, so I will allow them only to access it through a method. All right. Now what can I do? I can put validation in that says, gee, if they um, you know, try to put in a negative number here, I can throw an exception. Later on in the class we'll talk about throwing and catching exceptions. All right? But I can put code in there to trigger an error. And the nice thing about this is because this is in the class for dinners, it'll take effect for any other page that tries to use this class. So you might say, well, you have validation on the page. That's true, but what if the next programmer that comes along that creates a page to do this calculation or to do a similar calculation um, doesn't remember how to do validation, so they skip that part, right? You could still have the potential of having a negative uh, dollar amount coming in. Again, the, the idea here is, is not the specifics of this particular calculation, but again, the concept of we've taken something that we've defined as being a calculation our business needs to perform, and we've put it in a separate file, all right, as a custom class. We put methods that do all the calculations that we need to and set the attributes. We've defined the attribute, but we've made it private so that the outside world can't go in and mess around with it. Uh, otherwise, they could set it wrong. Now, um, VB doesn't follow that philosophy, right? In VB, the attributes are typically in the, the built-in components are typically not uh, private, right? Because I can say things like label one text. I'm directly manipulating that attribute. All right, I'm putting a value in it. Um, this is sort of a philosophical thing, you know, about, about how you, how you want to code or a, a conceptual theoretical thing. I think it's better not to allow your attributes to be accessed in that manner, but instead use set functions for them. So when I typically write a custom class, I'll, I'll write a set function for it as opposed to making the attributes public. For the purposes of this class, I won't hold it against you if you, if you make uh, your attributes public and just set them like you, like you do it. All right? Now, Here's what I'd like you to do with the rest of today's time. We have about a half hour's worth of lecture left. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go, we're going to go up into the lab, and instead of me talking, we're going to uh, let, you, let you work. All right. And we're going to let you work on this problem. All right. And if you recall, I did this calculation three different ways. One way I did it was having all the code in the event. Second way I did it is I had it, the code in a function. And then the third way I did it, I did it with the code in a function in a separate class. I want you to do this any way you think you can do it. The ultimate would be is if you can put it in its own class, but <clears throat> if you're confused about steps of this, that's fine. I want you to potentially work together with people. You know, we have Five people, you know, I don't know, we can have a group of two and a group of three, or everyone can work on it individually and ask each other questions. Here's a problem I want you to solve, all right? I want you to calculate how much it's going to cost to take a trip. And I want you to put in the miles of the trip. I want you to choose the automobile that you're going to use. Economy, standard, luxury. And I want you to choose the grade of gas that you're going to use. Um, regular plus premium. Let's assume that an economy car gets 
35 miles per gallon. A standard car gets 25 miles per gallon and a luxury car gets 15 miles per gallon. Let's assume that regular gas is 325 a gallon, plus is 350 and premium is 375. So you don't have to use radio buttons, that's how I drew it. If you'd prefer to use a drop down, that's fine. But the user should be able to enter in a number of miles and then make choices for the kind of gas, and the kind of automobile and it should show what the cost is. So for example, if I said that I was going on a hundred mile trip using a standard car and I was using regular gas, the total would be, let's see, a hundred miles, 25 miles per gallon, so it would take me four gallons. Four gallons of regular would be four times three and a quarter, which would be 13. So it should show thirteen dollars. Alright? You can work on this as long as you want, but I would like you to at least work on it until 6.30 because 6.30 is the end of our lecture time. Any time after that, strictly speaking, is your time to work on your lab assignments. Okay. I'll go upstairs and, and unlock the door, then I'll come down and, and grab this code so I can post the example to Angel. And Again, feel free to work with others uh, on this.